Good morning. Let's try that again. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship on this first Sunday in May. My name is Reverend Lauren Hodson. I am the minister of St. Matthew's United Church. I welcome you on behalf of myself and my colleague, Reverend Russ Day, the minister of Bloor Street United Church, our two congregations together for worship. What a gift. I invite you to take a moment just to settle in. Settle into this time. Do whatever you need to do to let go of anything that might be getting in the way of you being fully present here in this time of worship. Welcome. Feel yourself welcomed. Welcome if you are old or young or a little bit of each. Welcome if you are queer or straight or a little bit of each. Welcome if you are doubting or believing or a little bit of each. Welcome if you are saint or sinner or a little bit of each, aren't we all? Welcome if you have a house but no true home. Welcome if you have a home and a chosen family but no safe place to lay your head at night. May you find a spiritual shelter here for an hour or a lifetime. Welcome to people of all colors, all genders, all physical, mental, and emotional abilities. Because you, because each of you are here today, this body is whole and perfect. Friends, as we move into worship, we take a moment to acknowledge this place where we find ourselves. Acknowledge the sacred ground on which we gather. This has been a site of human activity for more than 15,000 years. This particular land is territory of the Wendat and Patoon First Nations, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Seneca, the Métis Nation, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, the meeting place of Toronto is home to many, many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island. And we are incredibly grateful to have the opportunity to gather in community here on this territory. In our gathering, we are also mindful of broken covenants and the need to strive to make right with all our relations. Friends, I'd invite you to join me in our unison prayer for our candle lighting, our candle lighting blessing. Thanks be to you, O oh God, that we have risen this day to the rising of this life itself. Be the purpose of God between us and each purpose, the hand of God between us and each hand. Be the pain of Christ between us and each pain, the love of Christ between us and each love. O oh God, who brings us to the bright light of every new day, bring us now to the guiding light of this place. Amen. Mike, uh, first, before we move to my prayer, the prayer I'm going to do, I, I want to do two things. The first thing I want to do is say thank you to all of those of you who sh managed to get across the city today to come to this worship service. I had adventures. The second thing I want to say as a newcomer to Toronto who lived in Montreal for a long time is to tell you that there are karmic consequences to premature celebrations. When the Leafs scored in overtime, Game 7 against Tampa Bay, and I was awakened to fireworks, and there was street closures, 
I knew the next series would not go well for you folks. So remember in future years, hold the fireworks until you win the cup. Okay. Our quotient of maritime or sarcasm has been surpassed for the day and let us return to prayer. You'll notice that our opening prayer is taken from Psalm 99. It's responsive and you'll be able to see the words on the screen. Creator God, you reign. Creator God, you sit enthroned upon cherubim. You love justice. You establish equity. You execute righteousness. We fall short of your declarations. We thwart your purposes. Our wrongdoings will be overcome. I'm reading John 14, verses 1 to 10. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going? Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. These are the words of life, which in faith become the living words. Thanks be to God. So, there are two um, objections, problems, difficulties. I might be just a little loud, Oscar. Um, <clears throat> that's a, a description of what I'm hearing now, a, not a prediction of what's going to happen in the sermon. <laughs> but it could. Um, with this passage. Christians, let me put it another way, a lot of progressive Christians choke on parts of the passage that John read for us earlier from John. And it especially focuses on this part. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Which historically has been interpreted as Jews don't come to the Father. Muslims don't come to the Father. Buddhists don't come to the Father. Uh, and even sometimes within Christianity, those schisms were exacerbated by turning to this passage. So, 
Let's deal with that just briefly. This passage in the Gospel of John was being written maybe a century after Jesus' life. It was shaped somewhat by a Christian Jewish polemic that was emerging, but it was also shaped by the dynamism of the factors happening in that part of the world after Jerusalem was flattened by the Romans. And so the passage is meant to speak to a very specific context. I am the way, the truth, and the life. It's just another false orthodoxy to say, I'm the only way, I'm the only truth. He was saying, I am taking the way. I am taking the life. I'm opening to other dimensions. I'm choosing love. And so, friends, whenever you feel your life is being compressed and there's no answers, just breathe deep like the kids in the children's time. Take the way. Take the truth. Take the love. Take the life. There's a more recent problem. So I go to the beginning. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? What's this referring to? Perhaps other things. It's also referring to life after death. Life after death. I don't know about y'all, but I've been listening to sermons for 40 plus years, and I can count on the fingers of one hand the number of times a preacher really talked about life after death dealt with it thoroughly on a Sunday morning. I bet you if you went to the previous 40 years of the United Church, that would not be the case. I bet you if you went to Baptist churches and charismatic churches and evangelical churches and even Roman Catholic churches, that would not be the case. So what is it that makes those of us who are liberal Protestant Christians, choke on the discussion of life after death? I think the answer is fairly obvious. We choke on it because our culture chokes on it. The larger worldview of Western civilization does not know what to do with that issue. And it largely arises from a dynamic that Margaret Wheatley speaks to very concisely in her book, Who Do We Choose to Be? Are any of you been reading Margaret Wheatley? Oh, well. You actually have been to seminars with Margaret Wheatley, right, Lauren? Yes. Now, just to augment this sermon uh, with a little more credibility, Everybody look at Lauren, and when you think about Margaret Wheatley, does she get a thumbs up or a thumbs down? All right. Um, this is the problem she articulates in her fine, fine book, Who Do We Choose to Be? Years ago, I realized that in all human cultures, all of them, there are ways of knowing beyond the five senses that supported their survival and manifested in cultural expressions and rituals. They knew that there was more going on than what our five human senses reveal, and usually they named other senses, such as intuition and, this is the one I really want to highlight today, 
consciousness. Intuition and consciousness. They had detailed maps and complex practices that enabled them to work with the order inherent in the world. Inherent meaning unseen. Now, just a sidebar before we continue with Margaret Wheatley. Kingdom of heaven is a, within you and among you. Kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God. When Jesus was talking about the kingdom of heaven, he was pointing to an order inherent, buried within our realities, not seen with the five senses. Okay, back to Margaret. I am noting that human cultures have developed their own sciences for interpreting within the elements, the planet and the universe. Western science dismisses this vast body of human wisdom by labeling it magic, ignorance, or science illiteracy. There, there comes the big volume there, Oscar. But our science is just the most recent means to make sense of reality. Its arrogance is neither justified nor helpful, which is funny for Margaret Wheatley to say, because she's a scientist. She studies science deeply and takes the learnings from science, especially systems theory and physics and chemistry, and applies it to leadership. I continue. It is in our nature to ask questions of existence, and also predictably, as soon as we discover what appears to be an answer, it becomes orthodoxy. The only belief system tolerated. Too many scientists now believe that their answers are the one true answer. If phenomena can't be explained by physical manifestations, they don't exist. And if we can't find a function such as consciousness in the brain, it doesn't exist. What I would assert is that liberal Protestants are doubly done in by double orthodoxies. There's the old orthodoxy which the Christian church imposed on Western civilization through a dualistic way of looking at the world. Descartes may have put it the best when he called it the ghost in the machine. The church said there's body and spirit, they're separate and split, and spirit's most, more important than body. Ghost in the machine and the ghost is the important one. Then science comes along and says, there's a machine, but there's no ghost. And those of us who are shaped by both science and religion were doubly hamstrung. So <clears throat> how do we get out of this double hamstringing? I want to help us begin to get out of it by telling you a story about a woman named Alma. <clears throat> Not long after I went to serve a church in Halifax called St. Andrew's United Church, a couple named Roy and Alma joined. They were at about a retirement age. And this church was kind of in a dynamic moment. It was really missionally oriented. And one day amongst the circle of leaders in the church, we realized there was another dualism happening. And that dualism was between all the good Christians who came to church on Sunday mornings and all the poor people and homeless people who came to the Sunday suppers, 250 of them every Sunday night in late afternoon to be fed. Now, the good Christians would cook food and drop it off and then 
go home while university students and others would serve it. And Alma said to herself, a bridge needs to be built. She wasn't an overly assertive person. When you meet her, you wouldn't have think she thought she was the most um, sort of courageous person in the world. But she grabbed a hold of this problem and created something called the drop-in that ran from the end of church to the beginning of the Sunday suppers. And she went around and she grabbed members of St. Andrews by the scruff of the collar. And she said, this is the week you're going to go to the drop-in. And you're going to not bestow your money or your good graces upon the people who are coming early now out of the cold to wait for the Sunday suppers. You're going to sit down and play crib with them. You're going to sit down and play cards with them. You're going to play chess with them. You're going to drink cocoa with them. You're going to share a sugar high. You're going to get to know their lives, and you're going to let them get to know you. And I always wondered, because I tried this, and they just sort of, um, what was it about Alma that convinced people to do this? And then I learned the other thing she did was she was a volunteer on the palliative care ward at the um, VG Hospital in Halifax. And she would spend hours each week sitting with dying people and their families. And she never kind of showed up and said to me, you know this wonderful thing I do three days a week? Well, I saw one time when I was sitting with a family and Alma came in. Alma walked in the room and all of a sudden it was just filled with soul. And then Alma got older. By the time I had been there about 15 years, she was in her 80s. And she came to me one day after a service about prayer. And she said, I want to tell you something. When I was a little, little child, I could remember where I was before I was born. And I kept saying to myself, don't forget, don't forget. And then I forgot. And she said to me, I'm starting to remember. And a few months after that, Alma was diagnosed with terminal cancer. It was almost like something was returning to her to help prepare her for the next phase of the journey. And uh, Alma died one weekend. I went and, and sat with her and her family for the last time, her and her husband, on a Saturday afternoon. She'd been in a coma for nine days. And we stood at her head. And I put my hand on her head, and I was praying for her and for God to accept her into God's arms on her journey. And then I switched to praying for Roy, and I said, God, hold Roy in your comfort because I know he will have deep grief. And Alma opened her eyes and looked up and said, yes, and then went back into her coma. If you go to Sunday night, the next night, there's an event being hosted at St. Andrew's Church called God and Cancer on a Sunday evening. And I'm just sitting in a pew I wasn't the leader or a participant. I was just sitting in while a number of people who were involved with the palliative care ward were leading this evening of song and musical performance and dramatic performance and discussion about God and cancer. And I remember having a feeling for about, about half hour into the event, I just had this overwhelming feeling because all these people loved Alma. They knew her from the palliative care ward. Alma is palpably here. And I, for some reason, reached into my pocket 
and opened up my phone and found a text from Roy saying, 20 minutes ago, Alma died. And after it was over, I went up to talk to David, the, the uh, palliative care chaplain, and to my colleague Susan, who was helping to organize it, and some other people from uh, the event. And I said to them, I, I had such a powerful sense of Alma. And every one of them said, she was here. I felt it. I knew she was here. She died in that moment when all the people who loved her and worked with her were congregated together in her church. Now, if you go to the ghost in the machine analogy, you would say Alma's spirit lifted out of her body and came over and sort of floated around amongst us on that Sunday evening. But I would suggest it is time for a reconciliation of science and religion. And I would suggest we take the analogy of the ghost in the machine and we say, off you go into history with Descartes and we pick up the new analogy of quantum entanglement. It's an analogy. And I suggest we work it in this way, which is when we love someone, we become entangled with them. And their consciousness knows how to find us anywhere in the universe. Consciousness does not exist only in the body or reduced to the four dimensions of time and space. Consciousness, as the great growing mystery of theoretical physics is teaching us, consciousness just is everywhere beyond space and time, and certain things entangle us, and when we are entangled, we cannot be lost to each other. So let me jump ahead further down in that passage of the Gospel of John. Jesus is still speaking. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. You have loved me, so we are entangled, and I am in the Father, and therefore the Father is in you, and we cannot be separated. And he knows that he's going to die, and they're going to die deaths of martyrdom. And he's not talking about life after death. He's talking about life before death and all around death. He's saying, flipping now into the language of our current time, we don't live in four dimensions. We live in many dimensions, a fifth dimension, which is beyond time and space. That dimension, let's call it the kingdom of heaven, is alive in you right now. And it was before you were born, and it will be after you die. And when you die and this body is harvested and carried off to be composted in some way, that part of you still goes. So let me say couple of things to St. Matthew's. Speaking in the courage of Alma, for she is in me and I am in her, and we're both in Jesus and we're all in the mother. Your beloved Lori's mother, Shirley, died this week. And yes, there is grief. But she is in Shirley and Shirley is in her. And you love Lori. And so in this moment, you can send love and spiritual energy to her and her family to navigate their grief. We are entangled. I'll also say to St. Matthews, Lauren is leaving. But she can never be lost to you. Her relationship with you is not boxed into an 11-year timeline. 
it was before and it will be after. And since you've shared affection, it will be always. Finally, a little word for us and each of you to prepare you for the time when your body's journey ends and you will be harvested. comes from a new gospel, the gospel of Blue Oyster Cult. All our times have come here, but now they're gone. Seasons don't fear the reaper, nor do the wind, the sun, or the rain. We can be like they are. The door was opened and the wind appeared, the candles blew and then disappeared, the curtains flew and then he appeared saying, don't be afraid. Come on, baby. She had no fear. And she ran to him and they started to fly. They looked backward and said goodbye. She had become like they are. She had taken his hand. She had become like they are. Come on, baby. Don't fear the reaper. May God bless you and keep you. May God make her face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May God lift up their countenance before you and give you peace. Go in peace. Amen.